Um, Chief? Yes, sir. I will be uh, leading off the presentation on this item, and I would like to uh, read into the record before I start a PowerPoint presentation. Um, the letter that I sent to the Board of Directors for Public Consumption. Tonight, you'll be receiving a presentation of a draft fire suppression assessment engineer's report and review to service review, a revenue to service review. To address a significant drop in property tax revenue since 2008, the district has reduced operational cost, increased efficiency measures, and maximized cost recovery efforts. The closure of six engine companies necessary to align expenditures with lower revenues has reduced the district's emergency response capacity and negatively impacted its response time performance, which is deficient when measured against national best practices and this owns board's adopted policies. With the recovery in property tax revenues projected to lag behind other signs of economic recovery while calls for service increase, the district continues to examine options for supplemental revenue resources. A Citizens Advisory Committee was conven convened in October of 2012 to review the district operations and financial issues and to advise the district on its options. For more than a year, this committee engaged with senior staff to develop an approach that considered fairness and equity balance with a demonstrated need to improve community safety. This committee was provided an update in January of 2014 on the progress of the effort and expressed support for moving this process forward. The enclosed reports by Wildan Financial Services, Perens Draft Fire Suppression Assessment Engineers Report in Perens, and CityGates Associates, Perens Revenue to Service Review in Perens are separate but complementary studies of the fiscal, operational, and legal considerations attendant to the potential levy of a special fire benefit assessment. <clears throat> The draft assessment engineer's report describes a proposed plan including the services, budget, parcel breakdown, methodology, and corresponding assessments. The revenue to service review provides an objective look at the service delivery options for the district relative to current and forecast revenues and expenditures. With that, I would like to have the first slide brought up to kind of recap where the district uh, is at. For the public at home that is watching on TV and the public in the audience, I think this slide really tells a story not just about SAC Metro, but about the state of California and communities up and down uh, the state. But in direct relationship to us as Metro Fire, we are a property tax driven organization. That is where we receive a majority of our revenue to run the district to provide the services to our citizens. And if you, and this is a kind of a, a refreshment, if you look at the light blue, the property tax revenue from which fire suppression must be funded, must be funded out of property tax, um, you will notice that we had a precipitous drop off starting in 2008, 2009. And over those years, we ended up at about 22 million a year in lost property tax revenue on an annualized basis. You will notice that cost recovery fees, which is our ambulance service, and fire uh, uh, fees as far as fire prevention, we were able to recover a little bit of that. Um, but with that, if you see the spike that goes up right above the word recovery over the Y, uh, right around the 12, 13 year. That's because we reached further agreement with 522 and converted six ambulances that were being run privately to single role paramedic EMT ambulances and therefore there was an expense that went that as, with that as well, but also an increase in cost recovery. Next issue. Here is a demonstration of what I like to refer to in 06, 07, 07, 08 as Alan Greenspan would say, irrational exuberance, where expenses under former uh, administrations did not meet um, the revenues that were coming in. But actions were taken very, very quickly uh, to address that issue, and they were brought back in line. If you look at 9, 10, or 10, 11, you'll see that the red line blips slightly up. That is because we bought this building that you're in today for $6 million on the block uh, as it went into foreclosure. And the reason that we did that is because we had personnel spread throughout the 417 square miles and there was no efficiency in operation. 
It should be noted that about six months ago, we were offered $15 million for the building as it sits today. And more importantly, we leased the entire first floor of this building to Sutter IT, which makes our complete bond payment on this building through the lease agreement. So it was a business decision. Once we floated the bond, we paid ourselves back. The next rise in expenses and revenues has to do with that conversion to the single role paramedic program that we entered into. Next slide. You will hear about staff layoffs, you'll hear about redeployments, efficiencies, you'll hear about station closures. You're gonna hear about massive labor concessions that we have been working on over the last four years. Not only did our labor unions give up 12% in guaranteed raises forever, no kicking the can down the road, forever, they also uh, took a 12% uh, contribution into their pension, which was a 12% pay cut. They then turned around and revamped for new, new employees' retirement and the salary schedules and the incentive schedules. They also forgo overtime incentives. And last but not least, they ended up pre-funding retiree medical, and as far as I know, we are one of the first agencies whereby not only did we cap our medical costs with the agreement of labor and management, but we all contribute 8% into pre-funding the retiree medical, and the people that contribute to that are not only active employees, but are retired employees. And that allows us to fully fund our annual required contribution on a go-forward basis for retiree medical. We also instituted a vesting schedule, so you no longer get to work here for six months and get full medical coverage. You have to work a complete 20 years, and you get 5% a year. We've explored grants. We got around 21 million in grants. Uh, that is only bridge money, though, that bridges the companies, and we can't count on that on an ongoing basis. We are in the last major grant, we're in the last year of it, that staffs two truck companies 24-7 for the public. We've updated our fee schedules and our permits and inspections. So we have explored a variety of issues and not talked about them, but actually in action uh, implemented them to save around $198 million in long-term savings to our district. Just in the issue of health care alone, we cut our unfunded liability by around $98 million a year. Next slide, please. Service delivery. The reason this slide's up there, to remind the public at home, is that you will see the, the vertical line, and above it is written flashover. This board of directors has adopted the best practices of the National Fire Protection Association to have a four-minute travel time to get to your call. What that means is we allow one minute to receive the call at the dispatch center, one minute for the crews to get on the rig, and four minutes to actually drive to your address, set the air brakes, and go to work on your problem. The reason we do that is because at that six to eight minute mark is when a room that has a small fire in it reaches the point at which the entire room flashes over and is involved in fire. And once that occurs, a fire scientifically doubles in size every 60 seconds. So it goes from that room to 60 seconds later to the next room. Our job is to get hose lines there, get water on the fire, stop that flashover process from occurring. It also so happens that if you stop breathing, at the six to eight minute mark, irreversible brain death starts to occur. And as we know, we, large a lar we run a large percentage of EMS calls, as do all all-risk fire agencies. So that flashover also has that time limit, really, really sets it for EMS as well. So we're accomplishing both. Next slide. This is what's happened to our district. As we lost around 22 million in tax revenue, we closed six engine companies. We did all the labor concessions that we can, we can get. We've implemented all these cost cuts. From 2009 to 2013, our call volume a year has gone up by around 9,400 calls a year for service. That means that a busy engine company is around 2,000 calls a year for service for an engine company to handle that. That means why we should have been adding five or six companies, we actually closed five or six companies. 
And it is a fact that at any given time, 24 hours a day, we have a minimum of four units out on a call simultaneously. And normally during the daytime hours, we are upwards of 17 to 18 fire companies or ambulances that are simultaneously on calls out of 39. That is a very, very dangerous situation. And the call volume, it should be noted, is twofold. You will hear the media say that uh, fires are less and EMS is more. Our fire volume continues to grow at 25 to 3% a year incidence of fire. The fact of the matter is our EMS calls are growing at a much larger rate of 4 to 5%. So our fire volume is not going down, it's increasing. It's just not increasing as fast as the EMS calls. And the bottom line is this, before I turn it over to Mr. Stu Gary to talk about the CityGate report. Back in 2007, when I talked about that four minute travel time to get to your call when you're not breathing, the lady that came up here and started CPR, four minutes to her is a lifetime or an eternity if you haven't done it. It's not something you can read in a book or you can judge by dollars or numbers. It's about real human lives that are there when that's happening. And what's happened to her is even in 2007, we only met that travel time 64% of the time. And today, in 2012, we're at 56% of the time, and we're crunching the numbers for 2013, which we expect to be less and have here in the future. This is a real problem. This is a problem that this district, the board of directors, the administration and every man and woman that works for us has worked on globally to try to solve for our citizens. So with that, that's my opening comments. I would like to turn it over to the principal, Stu Gary, who will present the CityGate report to you tonight. Thank you. Good evening, Chair, members of the board, and uh, members of the audience. Stuart Gary, Fire Practice Principal for CityGate Associates. Well, you know I've been before you before doing deployment analysis for the board. This is a slightly different CityGate product tonight. This is a peer review of your internal fiscal teamwork, the peer review of external consultant work of property tax projections, and your cost of business due over time. So in effect, it's a neutral third-party review of your ongoing fiscal work to maintain revenues and services in, in balance. While the report is comprehensive and full of facts, figures, and statistics, I'm going to talk tonight more in words about the highlights of the report and this not be statistics and, and uh, trauma by PowerPoint. Here's the bottom line. Our key finding is your long-term forecast or revenues to expenses indicates that at the modest level of economic recovery that housing and business property values are now seeing, the existing revenue base does not provide sufficient growth income to support even the now reduced levels of service. So let me say that again. Even coming out of the recession, with all of the cost containment you've done, with the closing of the six fire crews, you're still running a deficit. And as long as you run that deficit, restoring service is impossible, much less adding service to existing underserved neighborhoods. What occurred, the chief did, did a very good rundown and brief that the housing and economic meltdown triggered a multi-year reduction in that property tax assessment and in your fundamental revenue base. And while every agency in California experienced recession-driven reductions, tax, property tax-driven districts as yours were hit the hardest. Not only was your housing depression, recession, deeper than other pockets of the state, but you had no other revenue resources other than a small slice of ambulance fees to balance your books on, where a city maybe could get more sales tax, different user fees, and have a more diverse revenue portfolio. You live or die by the property tax. That comprises 72% of your revenue. 
So how did Metro respond? You reduced service in six engine companies, specialty programs such as the dozer operation for wildland suppression, your helicopter operations, your attrited headquarters positions, you laid off. The chief summarized all of the labor personnel benefit salary concessions you've done. You've actually been in the vanguard of the state in reducing employee costs and benefit co-share payments, but you lost so much property tax. It's still not enough to permanently bring revenues into alignment with expenses. Over a six-year period, as the chief stated, it's without a doubt your call volume is increasing while your response time performance is decreasing. The lines move in opposite directions and you're now roughly in the high 50, 55, 58 percentile of travel time performance at the fourth minute. And it's taking you over six minutes to get to 90 percent of the calls. As we've said in prior deployment studies, just as the recession were starting, you entered the recession short a few fire stations for existing neighborhoods. You then closed six on top of that. So we're gonna talk about where going forward you might spend uh, new revenues. So the existing revenue and projected growth in property taxes won't even absorb your current cost of doing business five to seven years from now. And in fact, CityGate projects if you did nothing about the structural deficit, which you're not, you're correcting your labor costs, you could actually run into a cash flow projection problem in six or seven years because you only receive property taxes twice a year and in between property tax installments, you won't have enough cash flow to make payroll if you spend our reserves to zero. So maintaining healthy reserve balances, controlling your employee expenses are going to be critical if not a single new dollar of revenue comes in. And the HDL property tax projections would indicate you're not Marin County, you're not Palo Alto, you're not gonna roar those property values back overnight in just two or three years. They're gonna grow back very incrementally uh, in the Sacramento Valley region. Therefore, to restore first cut services and then add services, a new stable revenue source is going to be needed. And again, while you won't have a structural cash flow imbalance for maybe seven years, it's going to take continuing time to adjust your ongoing employee expenses to services. And this is really the forecursor of even if we do that, where do we find the money to restore services? So this graph says it all. In summary, uh, the blue line are your current expenses, and just with cost of inflation, fuel, uh, employee costs, heating and lighting for the, for the buildings, increased call volumes, as the chief stated, the blue line rises. The black line across the blue line is total revenue projected by your consultant's HDL as the economy recovers. Uh, and frankly, the black line doesn't rise as fast as the blue bars. It's strictly a structural deficit. The red on top of that is what it would cost to restore the services you closed to survive in the center of the hurricane of the recession. What would services restoration look like with additional revenues? You closed six companies and you were short at least two entering the recession, so that totals eight. A modest new revenue source would allow you to restore three closed engines to their original locations, relocate two of the closed engines to better locations where you had overlap before in prior uh, neighborhoods that were built separate to the merger of the district and the stations were a little too close together. So you could do better when you reopen those two, uh, two of those companies. Eventually move a re the remaining closed engine to another existing underserved area, and then with new revenues, add two companies to existing underserved area. Where would that look like specifically? I agree with staff that in the first incremental movement as revenues arise, you restore engine 26 and 106. The second fiscal year, restore closed engine 68. The third fiscal year, relocate a closed engine. The fourth year, relocate a closed engine. You're still not to eight added resources. But that's the general programming that as revenues slowly come online, you can restore services. 
and with that, uh, uh, our summary of a, sadly a very complicated and painful uh, revenue to services report, I'd be happy to take your questions before we go into the assessment report. Any questions from the Board of Directors? I know you have the complete City Gate report in front of you. I also believe that uh, we have it on our website uh, for the public to be able to get it. And I believe I thought I saw some people from the public and we may have had them for the handout out there. So any questions from the Board of Directors on City Gate? Mr. Chair, I have a question. Please. Sir, you, you, hello. Thank you for your presentation to date. Um, you used an interesting term this evening that I think needs to be reinforced. And that is you said Vanguard. Could you be a little more specific about what you meant by that, given your extensive background and knowledge about fire service in California, please? The larger the property tax dependent fire district, you're one of the largest in the state off the top of my head that is solely property tax dependent. You had no choice to survive the recession other than to do two things, close services, and sit down with all candor with your employee groups and say, we will not survive this without restructuring pay and benefits over time. And it's not just a 12-month restructuring, but as the chief talked, it's picking up a share of pension forever. It's picking up a share of retiree and active health cost forever. And it's partnering in a new paradigm of what you can afford to pay. And, and you as a larger property tax dependent district aggressively moved into those discussions and your employee groups cooperated because you, should, in my opinion, showed leadership, transparency of the revenue, and you couldn't argue the numbers. And you did what many school districts did, but other units of local government had a little bit more time to deal with. Most school districts were also immediately killed by the state in the recession and had no choice but to watch cash flow, shed teaching jobs, raise class sizes to even provide some level of service. And you took very much the same approach to your employees. Here's the cash flow. Here's the headcount we can afford. We're going to put a tourniquet on the bleeding by closing six companies. That gets us a year's worth of time. And then you went and negotiated. So that's what I meant by Vanguard is you exercised strong influence immediately to deal with the problem. There are agencies in the state who, in a Pollyanna sense, said, we'll grow out of this. Property tax will come back in three years. Look at the reserves we're sitting on. They spent their reserves to zero. They exhausted their re replacement funds. Then they tried to negotiate uh, pay and benefit savings. You tried to keep your budget healthy. You needed to buy fuel and repair fire trucks at the same time, keep stations open, so you and the employees work together. So in your opinion, since this issue hit us in 2007, we've taken an aggressive leadership, set the model, as it were, for the state given like agencies. Yes. And even given that leadership, it can't close the gap. Your property taxes fell that far. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair? Please. Okay, thank you. I would like to reemphasize a point that the chief made, and I think Mr. Gary also made within this presentation, is that this com I've heard the comment a lot about how, oh, you don't have so many fires anymore, and that is a total misnomer. It was back in the 70s when I think when we threw an oxygen tank on the trucks and started to do dispatch for first aid calls. That evolved into EMT response, and that evolved into paramedics and ambulance transport. And it's very, very important for me as a retired firefighter to let folks know that call volumes have only increased. When I first came on, the first year it was a big bet if it was going to break 20,000 calls a year. And we're well over 80,000 now a few decades later. The trend is just going up. And so against the backdrop of all these concerns, one needs to realize that the workload, the call volume, is constantly going up. And that is a huge factor in the necessity for us to increase services. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, one one comment. I, I noticed in looking at the uh, uh, chart or the table, 
uh, that refers to the percentage of, um, of compliant goals, reading that 90% goal. Starting uh, in 2007, it shows us at 64%, and presently, or in 2012, at 56%. What's intriguing to me is as those um, numbers uh, ascend to the present time, are we still at 56%? This was 2012. Uh, do we have a sense of where we are right now? No, we're just because we just closed 2013, we're just now running those statistics, and the staff will have an update for you, moment, not momentarily, but in, in a few weeks, as to what the 2013 uh, per response performance is, and we can append that table. And now one, one, one last point. The, in the uh, period between uh, 2011 and 2012, we had a 3% drop in, uh, in our compliant response times. Um, most of the others were 1%, 2%, but in that particular year there was a drop of 3%. Is there any conjecture about whether that's an, uh, an ascending trend as it seems to be that our our response times will continue to grow wider? Your response times will continue to decay, but the line won't be smooth because there's a certain amount of randomness to where calls occur. Okay. So you could have an increase in calls per year, but if most of that increase occurs very close to existing stations, your response times look fairly healthy. If that increase in calls is in the underserved neighborhoods, much further from fire stations, mm -hmm. your response times could decay dramatically in a single year. So we look at where the calls occur in relation to your responsibility and internally to the statistics, we understand what that variability, whether it's due to random location of calls or a real decay. The chief mentioned simultaneous calls for service. That's the real driver of decay over time because at peak hours of the day, you just cease having enough resources available immediately to go to successive calls in one uh, or two neighborhood areas. Thank you. One more question. And now, on those percentages, that's for the first arriving company of three people, is that correct? That's correct. So the balance of the assignment to where they can actually do work and effectively do a rescue and put the fire out could be substantially longer than the six minutes. And, and when the report says you, you're uh, somewhat over, not not as badly, but you're over your first alarm or three engines, truck, and a chief response time measure of eight minutes, you're getting to 90% of the calls off the top of my head at minute 11 something. I don't have that slide in front of me. And the preferred I, I response time would be eight travel minutes for all of the units to a serious emergency. And you're getting there upwards a minute 12. And again, that's very location dependent. The outer neighborhoods with further apart fire station spacing and maybe a closed station uh, in the middle of that multi-unit response could have much worse response times. Play Director Shattiger. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, you know, the Chief's comments and, and your very fine report um, very clearly documented the efforts that we've made to uh, continue to provide a level of service uh, the best that we can with our decreased revenues. I think an important point that's made here is on page two, the chart where you project the revenue and the expenditures. And I, I think it's important for the public to understand that, uh, you know, you can look at the red line, the blue line, you can say, well, why don't you just decrease expenditures? And that's where this presentation comes together and, and shows the importance of the measures that we've taken to decrease expenditures, the, the, uh, the give backs, if you will, that, that our labor has given and, and uh, the very good management that we've made um, to, to try to reduce costs. The point is the service level is going down and in spite of all these measures we've taken and in spite of the probability of increased revenue from our tax base, we're not going to get there unless we do something else. I think that's the question on the table. That, that, that's correct. And in fact, had you not taken the aggressive measures in a somewhat simplistic, but not over the top sense, had this board done nothing for five years, you'd be going the way of Stockton and the city of San Bernardino. I mean, you'd be looking at some kind of restructuring in bankruptcy be, because you couldn't have paid uh, your bills and made, made payroll between property tax installments. It, it, your, your problem was that severe, and to your board's credit, 
You, at this moment in time, as the chief slides show, your revenues and expenses are just about in alignment. But it doesn't take much of a cost at your size operation and diesel fuel, utility, overtime for serious fires to drive that gap back into a structural deficit or a CalPERS increase or a healthcare increase. That'll happen in the next five years. Mr. Chair, uh, Sir, you know, I know we're talking tonight about the impact that this has had on Metro Fire and our call volumes, and I get all of that. In the report, I think it's important to also give the public the idea that we aren't even talking about what we do for other agencies to help lift them up during their equally troubling issues. And so as an agency of our size, oftentimes we're asked to support other agencies at the same time. And while we're addressing just what's going on in Metro's jurisdiction right now, I think it's important for the public to understand that, that Metro does a tremendous amount of response and support of other agencies in this area. And that's not even addressed here. And so if you don't address our own internal needs, then we stop having the ability to even help out other agencies in the area, and then the problem even gets bigger and more problematic for the entire region. And that's where I don't, we haven't addressed it. But I think it's important to understand, we've got to fix what's going on in our own house because so much of what we do also is supporting other agencies and other citizens in this region because of the size of who we are and the capabilities that we have and the benefits. And we've got to continue to do that, frankly, because if we don't, there are some agencies around that'll be in a lot worse shape because we can no longer come to their aid when they need it. And it's very un unpredictable, but that's a real issue that we've got to address here. So, uh, you know, I know it's not talked about, but I think it's important that we, it's beyond Metro Fire most of the time too. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One, one more point, please. Also on this, to, to further go in and so the public understands what we've done, I mean, we have a, 3-0 staffing, is that correct, on most of our engines? And correct. Wouldn't it be fair to say NFPA recommends 4-0 on their engines? And so we're already one person down on every piece of equipment that we roll out of here. So we have that whole cost savings involved. And then, again, that's just more work for those three left to do. And then you compound that when you have our first alarm assignment. You mentioned three engines, two trucks. So that's five people less. That's a whole nother, almost two companies that were short um, going to a structure fire. So I think it just compounds when you throw everything all into there and the numbers really show just how short we really are. I mean, uh, we can throw engine companies, but when you talk about bodies, we're extremely short on scene. And I'd like to close with that's all the comments are, are appropriate and spot on and tie this back to what the chief opened with. And that's the time over temperature curve and how fast fire progresses. <clears throat> it's very popular right now up and down the state to say, well, two thirds plus of the fire service workload's gone to EMS. Let's just restructure and only cover EMS calls, which in particular cluster during daylight, the awake hours of the preponderance of the population. Fire service in this country has historically been viewed as similar to life insurance. You hope you never need it, but if you need it, you need it very quickly to keep your fire from spreading to the neighbor's property. So as you try to attrit and balance staffing to the EMS workload, you've already closed six neighborhood fire stations. More would have to be closed to to continue to fix your structural deficit. At some point, while it sounds good that we're getting to the EMS calls, your neighborhood-based fire company attack ability is so stressed, almost every serious fire goes to greater alarm and adjoining property proportions, and is that the level of service we want? Most of us, I think, citizens would answer the question, I like having a neighborhood-based fire engine 24-7, 365, to at least come and keep small fires small. Otherwise, you're gonna send more resources from a greater distance, they'll get there in a losing battle. So I think we very much have to, uh, those of us in fire service leadership positions, understand that if we move all the resources to EMS, it is going to have a firefighting outcome deficit 
And if that's what the public wants, then that's what the public uh, can, can pay for. But if they want what they've experienced for 100 plus years, they ought to be thinking about what level of baseline, neighborhood, 24-7 standby fire attack. Even though it's expensive, even though I only use it twice a month, do I want that protection resident in my neighborhood? That's going to cost money if that's the level of service they want. Well said. Okay. Further questions? Thank you, sir. With that, uh, next we will have uh, Mr. McGuire and Deputy Chief uh, Holbrook who will present the draft engineer's report on the fire suppression <clears throat> assessment. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, uh, as this, oops, that's what I get for putting my. As this presentation goes along, uh, because of the complexity of it, we've also brought in a Proposition 218, uh, our legal counsel for that, and that is Mark Mandel sitting here. So if there are any questions that you want to aggregate for the conclusion of the presentation relative to legal, uh, Mr. Mandel will be here as well. So, Mr. McGuire. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Jim McGuire. I work for Wildan Financial Services. And what we're here, what I'm here to talk about tonight is the proposed possible fire assessment. I don't have my glasses on. Okay. You can see the keyboard. <laughs> Before I go into how the assessments are calculated and what we're looking at in terms of a proposed assessment, it's, I think it's important to cover some, some basic principles about assessment law. Assessment laws are subject to state law in particular the fire suppression assessment law and the provisions of Proposition 218 which are constitutional. Uh, assessments must be based on special benefit conferred to real property. That's all they can be for. Um, key, key to this is developing a nexus between the services provided and the properties being assessed. You can assess for benefit received by people, residents, public at large. Assessments must not exceed the amount of proportional benefit to those properties. The assessment methodology developed to spread the operational costs must be for the benefits to those properties. On top of that, the general benefits must be identified, quantified, and separated from the cost that you're going to levy for assessments. You can only levy for special benefits. Unlike taxes, which a lot of government agencies are exempt from them. They are not exempt from assessments. So publicly owned properties would be assessed based on their proportional benefit just like any other property. Approval through majority protest is how the assessments are actually established. We go through the process of developing the engineer's report, the nexus, all the, all the fine tuning and technical end of what the assessments need to be but ultimately it needs to be voted on by the property owners. It's a simple majority voter approval by mail ballot. Uh, the ballots are weighted based on dollar amount. So if I have a $100 um, charge and you have a $200 charge, you get a 200 vote, I get a 100 vote. But again, it's only based on those ballots returned. Fire assessments. Fire assessments are pretty restrictive in what they can fund. You can fund operating, fur uh, furnishing, operating, maintaining and fire suppression equipment and apparatus, salaries and benefits uh, for fire personnel, but it's limited to real property special benefits. So it's not a case of developing a fire assessment to cover 100% of your fire, uh, fire assessment costs. It can only be for those costs associated directly with property. Assessments cannot fund EMS expenses. Clearly, that's a benefit to people, not to property. Um, wages, services, and supplies that are non-fire related. Uh, so all, basically all medical costs, a significant portion of your administrative costs and overhead can't be funded. Um, it is really specific to um, property and fire suppression. You also can't fund, as I had said before, general benefits. Those have to be identified and excluded from, from the fee that your uh, assessment that you're planning to levy. Special benefit relationships need to be correlated to the properties uh, and is based on risk to those classifications of property type. 
So identifying the fire cost suppression efforts to different, different land, or land uses, utilizing factors that are identifiable, such as the building size, the acreage, is the way that those are quantified. So to do that, the first step is to identify those costs and expenses that need to be excluded. So we've used your call data, which I've got to commend this district in having really good call data information. It's very unusual to find a, a fire district that has call data for more than two or three years. We had it for eight. That's a, that's a fairly substantial uh, pool to look at in terms of identifying where you've been spending the money over the years and where all the effort is. So one of the things that I had identified before that you can't use the fire suppression assessment for is for wages and uh, services and supplies that are non-fire related. So this assessment can't be to cover your EMS costs. Those are right off the top, off the board. They're not something this can that the assessments can fund. We can't also fund general benefits. And in your particular case, through the call data, we were able to identify what those general benefits are. Mutual aid being responses to properties outside the district or helping other agencies. Those costs are general benefit to the public at large or to properties outside the district. And so they can't be something that we can include in the fire assessment. Wildfires. Fires that are, generally exceed 24 hours in total effort uh, of the department. And we've discovered through looking at all the call data that tends to be at 150 acres. Once it gets beyond that, we're pretty much into a 24 hour or more uh, fire. And so those tend to be more of a general benefit to the public at large. Granted, they are a benefit to the particular properties involved, but on a large scale, it's more of a general benefit to the community. And so those costs, we identified how many calls, the effort deployed to do that, and excluded those. Um, community benefit, just overall general benefits that the public receives. By you taking care of fires, we don't have a whole lot of smoke. By taking care of land fires, we don't have so much erosion. There's no community interruptions. All of those things are somewhat general benefit although very difficult to quantify, reasonably they are a general benefit that you have to discount. So all in all, all those factors gets us to, by identifying what we need to exclude, we've now somewhat identified what are eligible expenses that can be collected under a fire assessment. This is gonna be a little difficult to read if you, uh, for those in the audience maybe, because the print's a little small, but in essence, this is just what I was talking about. We went through the salaries and benefits that, the age, that you guys uh, pay, uh, identified those that are indirect administrative support costs. Those come out, those are excluded. Um, Non-fire related EMS costs that are clearly nothing but EMS, those are pulled out and excluded. Um, fire suppression specific costs, those are all included. So those shift to the, to the side of what we can. Those that were mutual, which is a lot of your uh, uh, operation staff, they are both EMS and firefighters. So those costs were spread based on the call data. And looking in that and the total efforts that were involved, we came up with a percentage ratio of about 78% EMS, 22% being for fire. Again, fire specific to property, although the fire related calls may have been more if we couldn't identify it to a particular type of property or it was a call for um, a fire, a fire at a, um, for a car, those types of things are excluded. And so in that ratio in the call data, we were able to identify about 22% being specifically to properties. So that's why we use that ratio. We applied that same ratio to operating supplies um, and services related to maintaining the trucks and equipment. Um, if you go down a little further, you can see uh, district overhead expenses and supplies were entirely excluded. So the cost mm -hmm. of this building is not something we can cover. That's all been pulled out. Uh, and then in addition to those 
clearly identifiable excluded costs, we end up with about $30,000 or $30 million that could be conceivably levied as a benefit. But then we have to take out all the general, general benefit costs that we talked about. That brings us another um, $2.7 million of general benefit costs that are excluded. So now we're down to about $27 million of eligible costs. In addition to those direct costs, obviously, in establishing an assessment district of any type, you're going to have administrative overhead and incidental expenses that are authorized under the law. So what the county is going to charge you to put the assessment on the tax rolls, administrative for doing engineer's reports each year, doing all the things that have to be done for data updates, spreading the assessments, putting them on the tax rolls, as well as the district's overhead costs related to the assessment itself, those all can be added. You add those to the, add those to the, to the $27 million, and then from that, we end up with approximately um, $27,720,000. You can see the administration costs are not terribly high, but they still are part of what can be levied as part of the assessment. Then from that, we're making a district contribution towards reducing that, Look, bringing a $15,700,000 uh, $15, to bring the total amount that we're looking at to levy as a potential assessment of $12 million. Now within this, I had made the statement before that you can't exclude government parcels. There is one exception to that. Under fire assessment law, SRA properties that are undeveloped cannot be levied an assessment. But because they still benefit, the agency needs to make a contribution to pay for their assessments that they would have otherwise had to pay. And that's an amount of about $254,000. Again, it's otherwise what you would be doing is shifting that cost onto everybody else, which is not legal. You have to you have to make up that particular assessment. So ultimately what will end up on the tax rolls is about 11700000 but the assessments are based on that original $12 million. Then based on the effort and the call data that we went through, all these calls were identified and related to particular types of property. So we took that $12 million and spread it to the different land uses within the district based on the percentage of their effort that was applied to them. Now, in this, it's interesting in this that you can see that 43% of the effort was expended on single-family residentials, although they are 90% of your properties. So the effort is the real key, not how many parcels are out there. It's where the fire services are being provided to properties. And so the dollar amounts of the budget are allocated to those different land use classifications. Then within those land use classifications, we proportionally spread the special benefit to the properties based on their characteristics using building square footage and acreage of those properties. We've implemented a sliding scale, partly because when you look at a, a fire response, up to a certain size building, you're going to have a certain amount of response. As that increases, it, for every 10,000 square feet of building, you don't send, keep doubling the amount of effort that you're, or uh, service engines that you're putting out there. It incrementally increases. So using a sliding scale is a good reflection of those efforts. Same sliding scale applies to um, acreage, but we use five acre increments in doing that, up to 150 acres. Um, using those those numbers that you come up with for each property based on their building square footages and their acreages, those are divided into the budgets that we've allocated to come up with the assessment rates for building, for building assessment rate and an acreage assessment rate. Those being applied to all the properties in the district, you come up with an actual assessment per EBU. And I'll kind of explain this a little bit just in using a single family residential. A single family residential that is 2,000 square feet, we divide that by 100 to come up with 200 benefit units, or, or 20 benefit units, I'm sorry. 
and then that's multiplied by the rate of $1.65 to come up with their assessment. And if they have acreage in excess of one acre, the acreage rate applies to that excess acreage above one acre. And that's, these rates are all, again, driven by the amount of um, benefit units calculated for that land category divided into the budget. That's how you get to these rates. Ultimately, when it's all spread out, the $12 million is allocated based on this, on this particular table, and it shows you what the results of those assessments would be. Approximately 6.6 .6 million would be coming from single family residentials, and I, I won't go through all, each and every one of them. I mean, you can see the table, and you've seen the engineer's report, and so I'd be happy to answer any questions. I tried to keep it simple. This is actually a very complicated methodology, but I wanted to get the basics out there and then b answer whatever questions you may have. Please. One quick question on it. Uh, you have put a lot of work into it, and I appreciate that. Um, in breaking it down for the building specifically, was there any allocation given for consideration to the protection systems in those buildings? No. Okay. No. That is certainly a factor that can be used, but on a district of this scale, that's almost impossible to do um, in terms of, of identifying each one, each building that may have a particular um, um, fire support service of their own, you know, in terms of sprinklers or whatever. However, using the sliding scale does more than compensate for that. It's not the single family residentials that are all, you know, 5,000 square feet or smaller that have sprinklers. It's gonna be your larger commercial industrial buildings that have those sprinkler systems. And because we use a tiering in terms of the building square footage, to, incrementally decreasing the amount per square foot they're paying for, we're recognizing the fact that those types of buildings typically have fire suppression systems. Sure. Please. Might, might be a legal question, but uh, on the, uh, you told us what we could spend it for, what we couldn't spend it for. If this was to sunset and we've identified those engine companies that we were going to put in place, when it sunsets, are those tied to this assessment, and then therefore we have to specifically close those companies? No. Um, again, this is a rev becomes a revenue source just like your um, property taxes are. How you utilize that money, I mean, the whole point of having this assessment is to, is to fill this gap that has been identified. Ultimately, and, we've, and this assessment is being proposed for a 10-year period, and we will sunset at the end of 10 years. Um, if, if we still need the revenue source, we'll have to go back out to ballot and bring it forth to the property owners again to renew it. The concept is we're hoping, as economies go, that 10 years out, the economy is better, your property taxes are back up, and the fact that this then sunsets, we're gonna be in a position to still maintain that level of service going forward. Director Wood. This may be a question better for uh, Mr. Mandel, is it? Um, could you just give us a quick, I know Prop 18 is an extremely complicated uh, area of the law. Could you give us just a quick layman's timeline, procedures, the steps we got to go through just to make sure we know what we're getting into? Sure. Um, Proposition 218 has two sets of requirements. Uh, there's substantive requirements and procedural requirements. Uh, the procedural requirements are that um, at least you need to hold a public hearing, and at least 45 days before that public hearing, you need to mail notice of the proposed assessment and the ballot to every property owner who is, will be affected by the assessment. Uh, the ballot shows the amount, the dollar amount of the assessment on it, and um, that's the amount that the vote is weighted by. Um, those ballots need to be returned back to the district by the public hearing. Um, technically, it's by the end of the uh, public comment portion of the public hearing. So if folks want to, they can actually bring them to the hearing listen to the comments at the hearing and then vote at the end. But most of your ballots, of course, will be coming in in the mail. Um, then after you've held the hearing, um, the balloting period closes. 
Um, with a district this large, you can't count the ballots right there. So uh, what will happen is uh, uh, Mr. McGuire and some people from his firm, as well as district staff, will uh, the next day go through, open all the envelopes, scan all the ballots, and determine what the vote is. Uh, then, as long as the ballots in favor are not exceeded by the ballots opposed, um, at your next meeting, you're able to go forward and impose the assessment. Um, then the other side of Prop 218, which is the substantive requirements, is basically a set of requirements that are related to making sure that each person, each property owner who is assessed is only paying their fair share of the service that's assessed. And um, Jim talked about most of those requirements already, but basically the main requirement is that you need to separate the benefits of the service into special benefit and general benefit, and only special benefits can be um, funded. Now with this district, since what's happening is we're not funding a discrete new service, instead we're funding a portion of your overall fire suppression efforts, we're actually funding we have to propose assessment quite a bit less than the total special benefit. Um, that's what Jim was referring to as a contribution. Really, that contribution is just, you don't need to raise that money from the assessment because you're going to meet that obligation out of your existing revenues, basically out of your property taxes. Um, so uh, to a large extent, the special and general benefit uh, calculations, as well as the other process, which is eliminating the things that you can't fund because of the restrictions in the fire suppression assessment law, is basically an exercise to go through, look at all the costs of the district, figure out which ones are eligible for assessment, figure out how to split that equitably amongst property owners, and then that is setting the maximum amount of assessment you could legally assess and in fact, um, the proposed assessment is, I think, between a third and half of that amount because uh, you obviously do have a large amount of existing revenues. And the point of this isn't to fund all of your fire services. It's to give you some additional money. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah. Please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to thank you and acknowledge the uh, extensive background research that was necessary for the assessment analysis that you gave us in your report. Uh, for those that, well, it, it uh, confirmed for me that uh, there was really no one place to go and get accurate, up-to-date information about parcels, acreage, square footage, usage, et cetera. So just to get the, the base analysis, all the statistics that go into, the numbers that go into uh, this project, it's a tremendous amount of data input and research. And I want very much to acknowledge that and to thank you. I, I would just add to that, if I could, that when we had 200 and 7,000 parcels, 210,000 parcels. When we started this project three or four years ago looking at this, there was about 30% that even the county records didn't have what was there. So as engine companies were out doing inspections and stuff like that, we identified parcels and they actually, as they drove by, said, what is on this parcel and that? And so this district has been able to obtain information not just so much for this project, but for our ability to deliver uh, fire and emergency medical services for parcels that <clears throat> really had nothing recorded as far as accurately on what they are. And that helps us uh, on our day-to-day -day operations that we do. So it was an extremely heavy lift uh, for the staff that went out there and did that. Our community risk reduction people, our engine companies, uh, put a lot of work into this over the years to get to this point. Well, in one last um, uh, comment, uh, first of all, I want to thank you, gentlemen. This is an extraordinary report. But also, I want to compliment the staff and Chief Holbrook for every time I'm a little bit of a data net and every time I've asked for data, I've, they've been able to come up and tell me exactly what's going on. And I find that to be um, extraordinary in organizations. Um, I, I came from an environment where we were lucky to know what day it was, let alone what happened yesterday. So uh, I, I appreciate this very much, and congratulations, guys.